uh, afternoon to talk about some of the eyelids uh, disorders. OK, uh, the eyelids uh, structure we will start just simply by the uh, simple histology of the eye structure. The backbone of the uh, the eyelid itself is called the tarsal plate, which is a collagenous plate. Inside this plate, we have a modified sebaceous gland. We call it meubomin gland, tarsal gland. OK, which which uh, secretes the oily layer of the uh, tear film. This tarsal plate is suspended or attached to the levator, levator palpebri superioris muscle here. And down there here, we have a very uh, smooth muscle called the molar muscle, which is innervated by the sympathetic uh, nervous system. And the levator palpebri superioris is usually, uh, is, is, is innervated usually or normally by the uh, oculomotor or the... حكينا uh, فين tarsal plate, هو بشكل الباكبون بشكل الباكبون اللي بيكون الايلد و inside it we have the tarsal glands or the sebaceous modified sebaceous gland اللي هم المبومين glands فينا elevator pelvis superioris muscle which usually uh, elevate the upper eyelid posteriorly here we have the conjunctival which is we call it the palpebral conjunctiva, which is covering the inner side of the tarsal plate. Uh, we have also anterior, we have also here, which is continuous also in the fornicial conjunctiva here. Anterior to the tarsal plate, we have the orbicularis oculi muscle. We have the subcutaneous tissue uh, uh, and we have the skin here. And to, uh, at the lid margin here, we have the eyelashes. Usually the eyelashes are directed in the upper eyelid downward and outward, and the lower eyelid usually they are directed upward and outward. So the eyelashes should be directed always outward away from the corneal surfaces. What we have also here, we have glands of modified sebaceous gland around the eyelashes, uh, the eyelashes, we call them the glands of Zeiss. We have modified sweaty glands also, these, uh, these uh, glands of mull, and we have a lot of uh, cutaneous structures that we might have them also in the eyelids like the skin. These are the layers of the eyelid. Usually, usually the eyelids can be divided into the anterior lamella and posterior lamella. The posterior lamella is compromised by the tarsal plate and the palpebral conjunctiva, and the anterior lamella is compromised by the orbicularis oculi muscle and the subcutaneous tissue and the skin. The eyelashes and what is the importance of the having the uh, eyelids proper, uh, properly opposed to each other? They will close each other. So when you close both eyelids, they will form what we call it the conjunctival sac, which is going to be filled by the tear film, which are going to be uh, wetting the corneal surface and the corneal epithelium. So it's very important to have the lid margin to be opposed and properly opposed to each other, the upper and the lower eyelids. What are the functions of the eyelids? The uh, eyelid will provide the physical protection for the globe. It is very important for the tear surfacing and tear resurfacing, and it's also very important for the tear drainage. So the tears are being distributed over the corneal surface by using the, uh, the lid margin by using the by using the lead margin so it like what will work like a windshield over the car glasses it is very important to have the cornea always wet with the tear film because the corneal surface is the first interface that the eye the light rays that will face coming from the uh, uh, space the eyelids are also very important in the tear drainage. The tear drainage is not just a simple gravity drained procedure. It is dependent on the function of the eyelids and the function of the uh, orbicularis oculi muscle and the integrity of the facial nerve. As we know, the lacrimal canaliculus are embedded within the eyelids with the puncti also. And so the puncti of the, or the, puncti, the lacrimal puncti should be also well, uh, well positioned in the, into the globe itself. So the eyelid position is very important also for the tear drainage. Also the orbicularis oculi fibers, they are surrounding the canaliculi and they also surrounding the lacrimal sac. We will have something that we will talk about later on, which we call the lacrimal pump, which is it is the energy dependent or the active process of tear drainage, which means that when you are 
linking when you're when you will close both when you close the leads the or the orbicular circular muscle will just squeeze the tear film which is inside the canaliculi into the lacrimal sac and at the same time the orbicularis ocular muscle fibers around the lacrimal sac they will be relaxed and this will make a negative suction inside the lacrimal sac that will suck in the tears into the lacrimal sac and when you open the eyelids the fibers around the canaliculi they will get relaxed so the canaliculi can be filled again with the tear film and the fibers around the lacrimal sac they will contract and they will squeeze the tear film into the nasal cavity so the eyelids are very important for the tear drainage they are very important for tear surfacing and resurfacing and they also will provide the physical protection for the globe for us for us as the humans Again, this is just a, a schematic diagram showing, as we said, the lacrimal uh, bump function that the, uh, the very important when we are closing our eyelids, the lacrimal sac gets larger, and when we open our get the lacrimal sac will be will be squeezing the uh, the, the tear into the nasal cavity. We will talk about some abnormalities of the eyelid positions. We will talk about inflammatory process that might affect the lids, some lid lumps and masses, and some eyelashes abnormalities that will be discussed during the coming uh, minutes. We will talk about toses. We will talk about intropion, ectropion, uh, and some other uh, position abnormalities. What we can see in this picture, what we can see in this picture if we compare the right eye to the left eye, we can say we might consider that we are more having either right ptosis or we might have left proptosis. So what might add us in differential diagnosis, what we are talking about? Either we are talking about ptosis or a proptosis in the other eye. We have something we call it landmarks that we need to depend on, which are we will talk about with something we call it palpebral fissure opening. How much the central part of the eyelids are away from each other. Usually, normally, the palpebral fissure uh, height is usually as the corneal size, which is usually around 10 millimeters from the center here. Usually, the upper eyelid is covering one millimeter of the upper limbus. So if we compare the right eye here and the left eye here, in the left eye, usually, the, as we see, the palpebral fissure is almost half of the corneal size, which means it's almost around five millimeter the pressure height here while here it's almost like a corneal size which means that we are talking about the 10 millimeters also if we can see here there is some reflection coming here this white light or white spot here this is a reflection from the torch reflection from the camera from the direct film scope usually it is in the center of the pupil and if we measure the distance between this point and the lead margin, the upper lead margin, it's usually half of the cornea, which is usually we, around five millimeter. This is, we call it margin, the lead margin, reflex distance, the distance between the corneal reflex and the lead margin, which is usually around five millimeters here. And if we see it here in the right eye, it's almost touching. So the margin reflex distance is almost zero here. This is also another sign of ptosis here. That means we're talking about the right ptosis here. Also, we have this line here. This is, we call it lead decrease. The lead decrease is it re represents the insertion of the fiber, the anterior fibers of the elevator palpebrae superioris muscle. Usually, here, if we look to the left eye, which is usually the normal, as we we might consider the normal eye here, the lead decrease is almost zero to one millimeter here, while the lead decrease here is very large here in comparison. It's around four to three millimeters. So what we are losing in the margin reflex distance zero, we are gaining it in the lead decrease here. And if we look to the eyebrows here, the eyebrow here on the right side is higher than the left eye, which we call it frontalis over action. So these are the static signs of ptosis that we might see, which is the margin reflex distance, the palpebral fissure height, the lid decrease, and the elevation of the uh, eyebrows in comparison to the other normal eye. This eye also, again, this is a, con a congenital ptosis. As we can see, the margin reflex distance is around four to five millimeter. Here, the margin reflex distance is zero to one millimeter. The lid decrease here is smaller than the lid decrease on this side, and the eyebrow is 
higher. These are the static signs. That means you can comment on these signs in the presence of only a picture. In the, uh, or if you don't have also a video or a history or anything, you just you can diagnose the presence of ptosis by these signs. So, the ptosis is an abnormally low position of the upper eyelid, which can be caused by a mechanical cause, a neurological cause, myogenic cause, and aponeurotic cause. So, the eyelids are held in position by the muscle, innervated by a nerve. So, what can cause this ptosis is either a problem in the muscle itself or a problem in the nerve that's innervating it or in the aponeurosis that hold this muscle to the tarsal plate or in the neuromuscular junction as the myasthenia gravis. The mechanical causes of ptosis, the aponeurotic disinsertion from the elevator muscle uh, from the upper tarsus also can cause uh, the mechanical type of ptosis if we have a conjunctival scar inside the eye. that will cause traction to the eyelids uh, inferiorly. If we have a very large lid mass, like a chalazion or a, a tumor, for example, that will cause ptosis, or if we have a lid edema that will cause the eyelid to be heavy for the elevator papyrus to be able to open it. So these are the causes of some causes of the mechanical ptosis. And neurological causes, the what supplies the elevator papyrus is the oculomotor nerve, so paralysis of this oculomotor nerve can cause uh, ptosis, Horner syndrome, which is uh, innervates the molar muscle, which is responsible about what, one to one and a half millimeter of the elevation of the eyelid. So usually the ptosis that's associated with the Horner syndrome is usually mild type of ptosis. Or sometimes the logical cause of ptosis, we have something we call it Mar Marcus Gunn, Joe and King syndrome. Usually the uh, levator papyrus burst muscle is supplied by the oculomotor motor nerve. In this type of syndrome, of the um, mandibular branch of the fractional nerve. So instead of being supplied by the oculomotor nerve, it is supplied by the trigeminal, the mandibular branch. So usually the baby usually have a ptosis and when the baby starts to move to use the muscles of mastications like the medial and lateral thyroid and the masseter muscles, the signals that are coming to the mandibular nerve, they will go also to the levator palpebral superiors and the patient will start to open eyelids. So this we call it Joe winking syndrome. Usually, it's very important to diagnose of the cause of congenital ptosis, the marker scan, jaw winking, or a miswiring, or just a simple congenital ptosis, because usually this will affect the decision of which type of surgery which we are going to implement. The myogenic causes can be caused by a muscular dystrophies, chronic external ophthalmoplegia, which is a progressive disease affecting the extraocular muscle, the skeletal muscles, or a myasthenia gravis, which is usually a neuromuscular. A neuromuscular disease characterized by the presence of antibodies for the acetylcholine receptors antibodies. And the myasthenic gravis ptosis is usually a progressive and characterized by fatigability, which is usually it is worse at the end of the day with a special with a fatigue and overusage of these muscles. The symptoms that might present with a ptosis usually they present with upper lid drooping might convert about cosmosis or functional sometimes if they are closing the visual axis. You, they might also present with the associated symptoms of the primary cause of that might has caused this ptosis. For example, a, a patient with the myasthenia gravis, she might complain also about diplopia. A patient with oculomotor palsy might complain also of ptosis and diplopia, also or reduced with the eye motility if it's associated with a cranial nerve pulses. Also, they might present associated disease of the primary disease like diplopia and isochoria and uh, uh, reduced eye motility can also be presenting symptoms with ptosis. Signs, as we have talked, we have we might have decrease in the palpebral fissure height. Usually the upper limbus is covering one to two millimeters. Of, uh, sorry, the upper eyelid is covering one to two millimeters from the upper limbus. If this distance is more, we should suspect ptosis. Uh, decrease uh, as we have also talked about the margin reflex distance, which is the distance between the central coronal reflex and the upper lid margin in the center, the palpebral fissure height, the distance between the central parts of the upper and the lower eyelids, and the upper 
uh, or the levator muscle function, which is usually we perform it by pressing the uh, upper eyebrow and asking the patient to move his eyelid from the lowest point to the maximum upper point and we measure the exclusion or the distance that the upper eyelid can move and we can document it by uh, millimeters and we usually compare the right to the left eye usually the patient might we can induce a sign of fatigability which is the myasthenia in which induce in, might indicate a diseases like myasthenia gravis the associated primary is the of other signs of extracurricular motility. Disease itself can cause other signs can lagging them in addition to the ptosis itself. The management usually, if the cause is myasthenia gravis, which can be medical or could be surgical, sometimes they are giving mystonine, which is an uh, 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 antibodies uh, or inhibition for the uh, acetylcholine sterase or sometimes it is usually in most of the cases it's usually surgery and the surgery depends on how much the levator function the levator papyrus function is there is it enough if we consider resection if we consider shortening of this muscle to elevate the eyelid and also it depends on the other the other possibilities of the other eye which must which surgery we are going to consider so most of the time the surgery of elevating the eyelid either by shorting the elevator pelvis superioris or attaching the upper eyelid into the frontalis muscle using a special type of silicon or artificial or synthetic slings or a bioavailable fascia lata slings for them that we can for, uh, be, configure it from the patient's own body. This is for the toes. The important of toes is that we need always to remember that we should look for an underlying cause. The, in this picture, as we can see, we have something that we call the inward or inward rotation of the lower eyelid. And this also can be seen in the upper eyelid. We call it intropion. So an interning, interning of the eyelashes towards the corneal surface. Most of the time, what is the cause of this uh, intropion? It's usually the lead laxity. Uh, uh, we haven't maybe talked in the beginning, but we will go here again. The orbicular circular muscle can be divided into two components, which is the pretarsal component of orbicular circular muscle and the orbital component of the orbicular muscle. If we have a generalized lack, laxity, generalized weakness of the whole orbicular circular muscle, the whole eye will go outward, causing an ectrobion, causing an ectrobion. Sometimes we have a differential lead laxity. That means the orbital component will be more lax or will be more lax than the pretarsal component. So the orbital component will override the pretarsal component that will push the tarsal plate inward towards the corneal surface and it will cause entropion. And because of the entropion, there will be a continuous rubbing of the eyelashes over the corneal surface that might cause a lot of complications like corneal abrasions, discomfort, tearing, and all these things. So the first cause or the most common cause of intropion, the inward rotation of the eyelids, is the senile laxity of the lower eyelid, which was caused by overriding of these muscles. What might cause this eyelid to be inward rotated? We might have a conjunctival scar here that will cause the pulling of the tarsal plate into the also corneal surface, as we call a uh, corneal surface, as we call it the cicatricial component, cicatricial uh, intropion. If we can see here, there is a, a fullness here in the our lower eyelid, which indicates that this skin under the skin here, we have orbicularis oculi muscle filling the space here. That indicates this orbital component of the orbicularis has override the pretarsal and caused this presenile type, sorry, uh, the uh, caused the senile type laxity or the involutionality type of entropion. What the complication that might result from entropion, as we saw, are related to the eyelashes when they are touching the cornea, that they will cause infection, they will cause ulceration of the cornea, which the sometimes in the early phases might be managed simply by pulling the eyelid down by a special uh, lubrication. But in most of the cases of these entropion, we might need to do a special type of surgery that will. Uh, that will separate for the pre of the orbicularis ocular muscle from the pretarsal component of, uh, of the orbicularis ocular muscle to form a scar between them to evert or to re-rotate uh, re the lower eyelid 
to outward and to redirect the eyelashes away from the corneal surface. And in the presence of a uh, scar, which means mean that you are having cicatricial entropy, we need to target these scars by a special type of flaps or relaxing incisions. In this picture, we see what we call it as ectropin, which means the eyelid is rotated outward from the globe. The most common cause is, as we said, senile, involutionary. The generalized laxity of the lower eyelid and the orbicular scrotal muscle will make the eyelid away, uh, uh, being, being away from the corneal surface. This will affect also the punctum. This will affect the tear fur and it will make just the dry, dry symptoms and sometimes the epiphora because of this ectropion. The other causes, as we can see, we have a scar down there that will pull the eyelid away from the globe, which we call it cicatricial ectropion, cicatricial ectropion. The management also of ectropion can be also, as we, ha we have said before, that also the facial nerve, Pulse can cause lag of thalamus, which is a ectropion caused by a facial nerve palsy. It can cause epiphora. And epiphora means that we have a tearing related, the tear drainage processes. Okay. And it might cause also eye irritation because of the dryness and the poor uh, tear film contact with the cornea. Treatment usually is surgery by making uh, a special types of surgery to shorten the eyelids or to re relax the scars if they are formed or by also using a special type of skin grafts to reform these skin scars. This is for the eyelid position disorders. It's just a small uh, review. We will talk about now inflammation of the eyelids. We will talk about blepharitis. Blepharitis, blepharo means lid. So blepharitis means the inflammation of the lid margin. It's a very common condition. You will face it almost every clinic in our daily practice. We call it, we can, as we have said, we divide the uh, lid lamella into two lamellae. We have the anterior lamella and we have the posterior lamella. If the inflammation is involving the anterior lid margin or lamella, we call it anterior blepharitis. Simply, it is the inflammation of the hair follicles of the eyelashes. We can see squamous depress at these eyelashes follicle roots. We can see inflammation redness at the lid margin, skin and the eyelashes follicles. Or we can see sometimes these eyelashes mated and joins together as a sign of this anterior blepharitis. Or the inflammation might involve the openings or the glands, the meibomian glands themselves, which we call it the posterior blepharitis, which means inflammation of the gland, the posterior lamella. The other name we can call it also meibomianitis or meibomian gland dysfunction, which is some sort also some sort of uh, seborrheic disorders that we will talk about later on. In this picture, we can see the anterior lamella. We can see the eyelashes with these. Uh, 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 crust these materials around these eyelashes and the eyelashes they are mated and diffused together and the hair follicles are red and they are inflamed as we can see also in this picture. So this is anterior blepharitis. Here this is also a color photograph of the anterior segment sorry of the eyelids showing this is the eyelashes here anteriorly and this area is posterior to the eyelashes. The anterior lamella and the posterior lamella they are separated by a gray line here. So this is sebum or oily material coming out from the meibomian uh, glands opening. So this is a seborrheic blepharitis, posterior blepharitis. Okay. What are symptoms that might bring these patients? They might, most of the time they might come because of the symptoms of the elevation of the eyelid by tiredness, sore eye, redness, pain. But most of the time they, because, they come because of the symptoms of that are related to the tear film. Because the eyelid secretions of the oily material are a very important component of the uh, tear film over your corneal surface. The poor or the dysfunction of these lid, of these lid glands, of the mobile glands, tarsal glands, they will cause also a dysfunction of the tear film stability over the cornea. So the patients might come with a dryness symptoms, tiredness, foreign body sensation, crusting of the eyelids, and also tearing and lacrimation. 
Signs, as we have said, we might see some signs of the anterior blepharitis, posterior blepharitis. We might see the scaling of the lid margin, inflammation of the eyelashes, follicles, uh, madrosis as a decrease in the number of the eyelashes, the embalming gland, glands opening. We might see plugged or clogged with the, with the sebum and embalming secretions. The tear film might look foamy and fill, uh, filled with the exudative materials. In a severe cases also, the Lead margin is a continuity or is in a touch in a touch with the corneal surface. So sometimes you might have an inflammation in the corneal surface because of the lead margin inflammation, which we call it marginal keratitis or blepharokeratitis, and associated conjunctival redness and injection that's associated usually with the lead margin diseases. In this picture, we can see uh, this is. In this picture, this is a killer photograph showing a very injected eye. This is severely red eye, and the corneal surface here is, has been stained by fluorescein, and this indicates an ulcer or a defective epithelium of the cornea and inflammation because an inflammation at the lid margin here. So we call it lid margin, marginal blepharitis, marginal blepharitis, cor uh, marginal keratitis. Sorry, Corrections of associations of seborrheic blepharitis associated with seborrheic dermatitis, could be associated with atopic dermatitis, and could be associated with acne rosacea, where there is a facial and skin telangiectasia and rhinophimia, which is the bullous and the regular swelling of the nose with hypertrophy of the sebaceous glands, as we can see in this picture. So, if you the facial telangiectasia, the same telangiectasia, we will see it at the lid margin, and we have rhinophimia and enlargement of the sebaceous gland of the face and the nose. Usually, the management of the seborrheic blepharitis is a very tough task for both the physician and the patients because none of them will get at the end satisfied. Lid hygiene for the anterior and the posterior lamella, which by cleaning it with the special components, warm compresses that will just uh, heat the eyelids and uh, might help in the uh, improvement of the symptoms. Typical staphylococcal agents and antibiotics, typical steroids, as some cases we might need, systematic tetracycline cleanse or dexocycline can be used and at the end we need to replace the most symptomatic component which is the art, uh, the tear film and stability symptoms which can be uh, replaced by special types of lubricant or artificial tears and at the end a mixture of all these procedures can be also implemented We'll talk about a little bit of lead lumps, masses. Then we'll talk about chalazion or chalazion, molluscum contagiosum, special type of cyst, squamous cell, papillomas, santhelasmus, keratoanchyngioma, and some nevi's. El chalazion usually a tarsal gland. Or on tarsal gland granuloma. It's a type 4 uh, chronic inflammatory uh, or immunological reaction. Nothing is bothering them, just apart from a small, small or large mass in the upper or the eyelid. No other uh, symptoms. Uh, Usually, it's caused by an obstructive moving gland, but then surface in a chronic inflammatory process inside it, but then surface in a granuloma, which we can see it a chalazion. Sometimes this chalazion or the moving gland get infected. We will get an abscess in this chalazion or the moving gland, which we call it internal horidolium. And in, in addition to the having this mass, we will have other signs of inflammation. We will have redness, we will have pain in these patients with the internal horidolium. And this is the infection of the hair follicle side, which we call it the external sty or sty or external horidolium. We say more about the Arabic shahadi, an inflammation of the hair follicle or the tarsal gland, depending on it. So, the management of the internal horidolium, we need to have systematic and tubical antibiotics, and sometimes we may need to incise these abscess. And the external or the external horidolium uh, uh, or the sty, usually we just we need to epilate the eyelash and to use uh, warm compresses and to use a topical antibiotics. Uh, systematic antibiotics are rarely need for these ties. In this picture here, we are seeing an umbilicated, purely, purely shaped lesion. Uh, umbilicated shape, the lesion at the lower or the upper eyelid, which is usually we call it caused by a pox virus infection that might be associated also by a follicular, follicular inflammatory process. This is one of the signs uh, of inflammation of the conjunctival heel follicular 
the reaction which might see it in the viral sometimes you might see it in the chlamydial infection this is this lesion here in the lower eyelid we call it molluscum contagiosum which is usually caused by a pox virus usually associated by red eye also treatment usually by a simple excision of these lesions these are special types the cysts they can uh, arise either from sebaceous cysts or they can arise from sweat glass with uh, structures so if they are coming from a sweat structures they will present by a transparent structure like this is cyst of mole and if they are presenting from an additional or accessory sebaceous gland as eyelashes we call it sebaceous uh, cyst of zeiss for either sebaceous or uh, sweat uh, cysts This is, uh, I think you have already seen this in surgery. This is a uh, skin papillomas. And papillomas, they can be either bedunculated or a sessile. For they are a frond like lesions of uh, proliferating epithelial cells on the skin. For they can be either zemahakena, sessile, or tessellated or bedunculated lesions. Okay, usually they are asymptomatic and the treatment is usually not needed. We can just simply by simple excision or coterie of these lesions. This lesion is important to recognize because it might be associated with a systematic disease. For if you have a subcutaneous, subcutaneous lipid deposition, which is usually symmetrical between the upper and the lower eyelids and both eyes, we call it xanthelasma. The xanthelasma can be associated with a lipid disorders or uh, uh, hypercholesterolemia or it could be sometimes familial so in, in just before doing surgery for these things to excise them we need to make sure that the li blood lipids are within normal limits okay in this lesion the differential diagnosis might come uh, to your brain or to your mind a lot of these things so this is a pinkish lesion present here at the inner angle of the eye with a central crater that's filled with a blackish material. You can think about a lot of lesions like this, but what might help you in differentiating such a lesion from, for example, a basal cell carcinoma or squamous cell carcinoma is usually the history. Usually such a type of lesion, which we call it keratoacanthoma, it develops in a very rapidly in the manners of days or weeks in comparison to the basal cell carcinomas, which might need years to reach such a size. So a keratoconthoma is a rapidly growing, usually pinkish lesion that's usually arised from uh, either uh, any part of your skin can develop keratoconthoma, which is characterized by this uh, lesion with a central crater filled with keratin. So it's a fast growing lesion. OK, progress into also a faster growing phase, then go to a stationary stage, then will go to a plateau phase, then it will leave a very ugly scar. And usually the treatment is excision always. Uh, we excise it always because sometimes these lesions might harbor in their bed a squamous cell carcinoma. They are considered a pre-malignant lesions for uh, squamous cell carcinoma, so we need to remove them always. In nevi or nevus or mole, they arise from the melanocytes, and I think you ha has been already discussed that during the surgery, which they can be considered as a freckles or intradermal or a compound nevi. It's just the same as any nevi in your uh, skin lesions. Uh, malignant tumors, we'll just have a few words about the uh, basal cell carcinomas, squamous cell carcinomas, and the malignant melanomas. They are just like also the skin tumors. The basal cell carcinoma is also a very slow growing tumor, which can be nodular, can be sclerosing, or can be uh, ulcerative in the form of rodent ulcer. They are present usually in the lower eyelid, and usually the lower eyelid forms the most common site for the basal cell carcinoma. It accounts for 10% of the all, the all basal cell carcinomas of your body. Although we have the largest organ in our body, which is the skin, and the lids form a very small area of it, still 10% of the basal cell carcinomas usually they happens uh, in the uh, eyelids, and 90% of the lid malignancies usually are a basal cell carcinoma. So if we have a lower lid lesion that's very suspicious to be of malignancy, 90% of the cases it is basal cell carcinoma. It's usually a very slowly growing tumor with a local invasion. It's very rarely to be metastasizing lesion. Usually it has a very favorable prognosis when uh, treated early. 
usually represented by a painless lesion of the eyelid. It can be nodular, it can be sclerosing, it could be ulcerative or rodent ulcer. Usually it is presenting with a pale, pearly margin, uh, which we need to have usually in the elderly. We have to have a very high index of suspicion of having such a lesion, which is the basal cell carcinoma. And we should always remember in the elderly, not every chalazion or a recurrent chalazion we should think about, about a special tumors that might arise from either the sebaceous gland or a basal cell carcinoma. We need to keep it in mind in finding a differential diagnosis of a chalazion in elderly or a recurrent chalazion in elderly patient. In management, usually excision, complete excision with a biopsy, or if it's in the located in the very special location of the eyelid, or it's large enough that will affect the contour of the eyelid later on, we might consider a more surgery or a frozen section that we will have during the surgery sectioning of these uh, excised tissue to make sure about the safety margin and the clear margin of these tumors. Cryotherapy and radiotherapy in the old times, but the cryotherapy and the radiotherapy, you will be weaned or you will be lacking the proper histopathological diagnosis. So the excisional biopsy or a frozen section is usually preferred nowadays. Usually the prognosis is very good in general, unless there is a very deep or neglect neglected tumors. Squamous cell carcinoma is a very uh, ugly looking tumor. Usually also it can present by an ulcer like this. The tumor, this is a very uh, metastasizing and can invade deeply in comparison to the basal cell carcinoma. It's a very ugly tumor. I think once you see one, you will always keep it in mind and you can suspect these lesions later on. So it's a very, uh, it's very less common in comparison to the basal cell carcinoma, but it's very malignant. It can metastasize to the local, local lymph nodes or sometimes orbital structures also can be involved by squamous cell carcinoma. It can arise de novo, or it can arise from a pre-malignant lesions as we have said from a keratoacanthoma or from a burn to the eyelids or from actinic keratosis lesions that also are pre-malignant lesions that might are the squamous cell carcinoma and might arise from. Ultraviolet light is exposure and for risk factors and usually treatment should be excision with a very, very wide, very wide healthy margin. Uh, this is a picture showing the abnormality of eyelash positions. The eyelashes should be directed anteriorly away from the cornea. The eyelashes can be directed posteriorly, which we call it tricheases. Okay, and sometimes we might have an extra row of eyelashes that might be uh, uh, arising from the sebaceous glands. Because the sebaceous glands are of ectodermal origin, they can metabolize into a hair follicle, a hair producing cells in a, in a condition we call it dystichiasis. So if we have dystichiasis or tracheases, the eyelashes will be rubbing against the cornea that might lead to a functional or a structural changes in the cornea of the form of irritation in the beginnings and later on formation of an ulcer in the corneal surface. The treatment usually of tracheases uh, or this thing is usually if they are small, few eyelashes, we might consider ablations or laser ablation or electrolysis of these eyelashes. And if they are large enough and cannot be managed by laser or surgery, we can do an averting lid surgeries to take these eyelashes away from the corneal surfaces. And thank you. Hello. Shukran, Shukran, Doctor Fawad. معلش بس علق يعني. الله يعافيك ويخليك شكرا النت اليوم للاسف سيء جدا اه والله علق عندي مرتين آه طيب ارجو انه ما تكون انقطعناكم كثير بنص المحاضره والله يسلم عليك يا رب ممتاز <تصفيق>